Welcome to this lesson about fundamentals of dynamics. In this video, we deal with the concept of inertial reference frame and Newton's law, system of particles and principle of conservation of momentum, constraint, Euler equation, Lagrange non-constraint system. Let's begin with the inertial reference frame and Newton's law, and in particular with Newton's law. So Newton's first law uh, states that in absence of forces, a particle moves with constant velocity v. And Newton's second law states that for any particle of mass m, the net force f on the particle is always equal to the mass times the particle's acceleration. So f is equal to ma, where a is the time derivative of the velocity, and it is the second derivative over the time of the position, the vector position, so r double dot. So that's the final reference frame. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame for which the first two uh, Newton's law are uh, valid and verified. So let's consider this example. We have a frame, delta prime, uh, which is a frame attached to a train traveling straight at constant speed with no friction. And an ice cube is placed on the floor of this train. So from the train, the frame delta prime, the ice cube is at rest and remain at rest. And from the ground, frame delta, the ice cube is moving with the same velocity of the train and will keep this velocity. But now, if we consider a second train, frame delta second, uh, accelerating forward, then the ice cube will be left behind. And from delta second, the ice cube accelerate backward even if there is no a net force on, this, on the cube. The frame delta second is not an inertial frame, and the first two law does not hold in this uh, frame. We can now state the third uh, Newton's law that states that uh, if an object one exerts a force F21 on an object two, then the object two always exerts a reaction force F12 on object one, given by F12 is equal to minus F21. It's important to note that uh, those two forces are aligned and therefore does not produce work. Let's now enter in a system of M particles and the principle of conservation of the momentum. And we define this uh, system of M particles and a reference frame centered in O. And we have uh, the vector position Ri, Rj and the vector r, which is the vector connecting the origin with the center of mass of our system. We can define external forces as forces acting on particles due to external sources, and internal forces as forces acting on the height particle due to all other particles in the system. We can now write down the equation of motion for the height particle as the sum over j of all the forces internal forces acting on the height particle plus the external forces acting on the height particle. And this is equal to the derivative of the linear momentum on the height particle. We can now sum all the, um, all the equation for the height particle and find out that the second uh, derivative over time of the sum over i of mi Ri is equal to the sum over i of all the in external forces plus the sum over i j with uh, i different from j of all the internal forces. Now, why i different from j? Because uh, there are no self-interaction. And uh, thanks to Newton's third law, we have that uh, the last part of this equation is uh, equal to zero. We can now write that r is the average radius uh, vector of all the particles, and uh, it's actually the position of the center of mass, and is r equal to 1 over m, the sum over i of mi ri. Then we can write down that the mass, time, the total mass of the system times the second derivative over time of r is equal to the external forces, where f e is the sum of all the external forces. 
then we can write down that the, the mass times the second derivative of the vector r over time is equal to the differential of the linear momentum of the overall linear momentum of the system which is equal to the force uh, to the external force now we can talk about the conservation of linear momentum the principle of conservation of, of momentum state that uh, if the net external force of a n particle system is zero the system total momentum p is constant so if there is no external forces the linear momentum is constant. This statement is also valid for angular momentum. Let's talk about constraints. So a system of n particles which can move in a three-dimensional space with no constraints has three times n degrees of freedom. If we impose a k-specific constraint, the final number of degrees of freedom will reduce to 3n minus k let's define some type of constraints but before let's give a definition of a generalized coordinate the generalized coordinates are just a set of independent variables which are able to describe the motion of the equivalent system having no constraint applied so if the constraint applied to the, holono to the system are holonomic then we can use only 3n minus k generalized coordinate to fully describe the system. An holonomic constraint in a, is a constraint uh, written like that. So it's a function of the position r1, r2, r3, rn, and the time equal to zero. So the most intuitive example of this type of constraint is the constraint of a rigid body, where the distances between all uh, the points must be constant over time. So this relation must be satisfied in any condition, which means that the two particles, they are always at the same distance. All constraints which are not holonomic are said to be non-holonomic. Some example, inequality constraint, like a particle which can move only external to a sphere of radius A, for example. So the modulus of the vector position R uh, minus a must be always greater or equal than zero or non-integrable differential constraint like rolling without slipping condition so a system without a time dependency constraint is said to be scleronomous an example is a rigid body condition on a simple pendulum so we have this constraint which is that the square root of x square plus y square minus l will be equal to zero so the distance between the mass of the pendulum and the point O will be always constant. A system under a time dependency constraint is said to be rheonomous. An example could be a pendulum with a moving pivot. Like in this example, so we have this point which before was uh, fixed. Now we can move uh, on this line and uh, we define a law of motion and it is x of t is equal to x0 cosine of omega t, for example. And then our constraint will become uh, the square root of x minus x0 cosine of omega t squared plus y squared minus l equal to 0. This function actually contains explicitly the time dependency. Let's now enter in Euler equation. So the first dynamic equation is coming from Newton's second law. And we have that the mass times Rg double dot is equal to the fo total force. So m is the total mass of the body, and Rg is the vector um, of the center of mass. We now assume um, a planar rigid motion, so we will have three degrees of freedom instead of six. And for the second dynamic equation, we have the angular momentum with respect to pole G is equal to the moment of inertia with respect to G times omega, where omega is the vertical angular speed and IG is the moment of inertia around its principal uh, vertical axis. We must note that this equation is true with respect to any fixed reference frame. However, it's uh, easier to express the moment of inertia uh, with respect to uh, the center of uh, mass. So if we apply the D'Alembert principle, we can now write that the derivative of the uh, angular moment over time plus 
the time derivative of the um, position vector cross product the uh, linear moment will be equal to the sum of all the moments r dot zero is the absolute uh, pole velocity so is the velocity of our pole p is the linear momentum and m i are the external tor torques applied so if we consider a fixed pole uh, we have that uh, r dot zero is equal to zero or if we consider the center of mass as a pole we have that r dot g cross product p is equal to r dot g cross product m uh, r dot g which will be also equal to zero the angular moment with respect to pole o is equal to the angular moment with respect to pole g plus o g cross product m the velocity of the center of mass moreover we can write down that the angular moment uh, with respect to O is equal to O P cross product P linear momentum. We can now expand the, the previous equation, find it out that the sum of all the moments is equal to the sum over E of O P E cross product M E V E, where V E is the velocity of the height particle, O P is the position of the height particle, and M I is the mass of the height particle. And this is equal to the time derivative of the sum uh, over i of OPI cross product MI VI minus the sum over i of the time derivative of the position vector cross product the mass times the velocity um, of the height particle. Then we can write down that the time derivative of the angular momentum with respect to O minus the sum over i of the velocity of the height particle minus the velocity of the origin cross product the mass of the height particle times the velocity of the height particle is equal to L0 dot, so the angular uh, momentum or with respect to 0 dot plus the velocity of the reference frame v0 cross product the sum over i of mi vi which is equal to l0 dot plus v0 cross product p so now we uh, state the lagrange non constraint system lagrangian mechanics is particularly useful whenever we face a problem described by the coordinates different from the cartesian one lagrangian function is a scalar function and therefore it's useful because we use scalar quantities instead of vectors Lagrangian mechanics is based on the principle of least action we define an action S as the integral from t equal to a to t equal to b of L dt and L is our Lagrangian and given a particular starting point and ending position the system follow a path between the start and the end which minimize the action for each q1 qn generalized coordinate we must have that the time derivative of the partial derivative of the lagrange function with respect to qi dot minus the partial derivative of the lagrange function with respect to qi must be equal to bqi well we have that the lagrange function is actually equal to the kinetic energy minus the potential energy and q big i is the non-conservative force so l as i said is the lagrangian function it is a scalar and it is a function of q and q dot the lesson is over i will leave you some references uh, where you find out the same notation i've used in this uh, video <laughs>